I was recently in Nairobi, in Kenya. And when I walked around, I could get 3G on my mobile phone. I was able to post to Facebook. I, in fact, bought a DVD on Amazon while I was in the, camp, in the uh, city. And all around me, people were using their mobile phones. They were using them to talk. They were using them to run their businesses. And a bit later, I went 50 miles outside the city, and there were still people who were using their mobile phones, but they had no access to some of the basics of life. And in particular, they had no access to electricity. Now, sometimes it's a bit difficult to figure out what it's like not to have electricity. But just imagine you're at home. You've got no light. You've got no phone. You've got no TV. You've got no hot water. Your life is completely different to the sort of life that you expect in the West. But for 600 million people in Africa, this is a daily reality. And what we're finding is that the gap between cities and the rural community is widening, as cities increasingly have access to infrastructure, but people in rural communities don't have that access. And it's one of the things which is causing a drive towards urbanization and overcrowding within the African subcontinent. I'd like to introduce you to Florence. Florence is a mother of three young children. And every day, she walks for about two hours to go and cut grass, as you can see. When she goes home, she has a half in the middle of her house. And when she wants light at night, she takes a clump of grass, she puts it into the half, and that will give her light for about five or 10 minutes. Now, some of you may have children, and certainly you'll know people who have, and you'll have some idea of how difficult it is to deal with a child who is crying in the middle of the night. Imagine doing that when all the light that you've got is five minutes of grass in the middle of your house. Other people use kerosene for lighting. This is Samuel in Wiki in uh, Kenya. And kerosene is pretty horrible stuff. In a confined environment, it's carcinogenic. Um, it kills thousands of people every year from houses that burn down and from children that drink kerosene and are poisoned. But kerosene is also tremendously expensive. We all know that some of the poorest people in the world pay the most for their electricity. If you don't have direct debit to be able to pay for your electricity uh, in the West, you're probably paying 20%, maybe 30% more for your power. That kerosene lamp, light for light, costs about 40 times as much as those lights up there. People who are poor in Africa are not just paying a bit more for their energy, they're paying orders of magnitude more. For their energy. And this is something that economists call the poverty trap, where people are spending so much on the basics of life, they're unable to save the amount of money they need to buy the things which will enable them not to spend that much money. But everywhere we go in Africa, I also find an enormous sense of aspiration for Something like 60% of people within Africa have a mobile phone. And people find creative ways of being able to get access to radio, to television, to media. There is enormous ingenuity in the population that I come across. In fact, of the younger population between 16-year-olds and 24-year-olds, 75% of them have their own mobile phone. But it's a cruel irony that at the same time, only about 15% of the population of Africa has access to electricity. At Azuri, we started thinking about this problem. And we started to wonder about whether we could provide power other than grid electricity into rural communities. Because actually, you only need quite a small amount of power to make a tremendous difference to people's lives. Renewable power is really great. 
Solar power is perfectly capable of providing a modest amount of electricity in a distributed environment. But solar power, like other renewables, has one fundamental flaw. You have to pay for it all up front. You and I are used to paying for things as we use them. Our food is pay-as-you-go. Our electricity is pay-as-you-go. Our water is pay-as-you-go. And so it's really tremendously difficult for people to be able to afford the initial cost of buying a small solar home system. In fact, a small system uh, in Africa is roughly the earnings equivalent of buying a used car. So we started wondering about whether we could look at the mobile phone and combine it with solar technology and come up with something different. And in particular, what we wanted to do was to see if we could use the same pay-as-you-go model that we have for mobile phones to pay for energy. So now what we have is a kind of a rent-to-buy model, where people don't have to pay a lot of money when they get their system in the first place, and they pay for it instead of buying kerosene and instead of paying fees for mobile phone charging. And what this does is to lead to a sustainable business model being attached to a sustainable technology. In effect, it's using technology to turn a development problem into a business problem. So we came up with a design which takes conventional solar power, but instead of it just working in the normal way, this product gets installed essentially free of charge for individuals. And every week, an individual would use their mobile phone to buy a week's worth of credit on that solar power system. And the system then works for as long as you like. Because solar is free, sun is free, so there's no point in charging people for the electricity. You're charging them to uh, be able to pay off the equipment. And after about 18 months, the individuals own that equipment and they no longer have to pay any more. They're able to unlock uh, that system. The cost of that solar power system is about half the cost of the kerosene and the mobile phone charging that it replaces. In other words, the solar power is better than net free. But it's a sustainable product that has a sustainable business model behind it and it can be rolled out, hopefully, at scale. When we started, we had a lot of sceptics. And really, they fell into two camps. There was one camp that said, people in Africa, in rural Africa, they're, they're really not very educated, you know. And you know, they're not going to get this. They're going to find it really hard to be able to pay for something in installments this way. And then we had another group of people who went the other way. They said, these guys in Africa, they're tremendously canny. And you know, within five minutes, they're going to have broken into your system, and there's no chance you're going to get your money back. <laughs> so we thought about this a bit, and we thought, well, actually, if you just take this and you put this in supermarket stalls, actually, probably both of them are right. But instead, we started working with communities within Africa. We took this system initially to a town called Kitali in Kenya, in Western Kenya. And we worked with local partners to educate, to sell, to train, to maintain these products. We started with one individual called Edward. And in the last 18 months, Edward has gone from a single entrepreneur to having four full-time employees and 45 part-time employees who are developing and maintaining these. On top of that, we've started working with Edward to bring technology to improve the way that the product is rolled out. He's developed a system in the cloud which enables him to get training videos down. So he wants to add a new installer, he can show that training video to the installer. We provided him with a smartphone application so when they go and install a system, they can record the customer's details and geotag it and it automatically gets sent up to the server. So we've got automatic access up to that information. And we've also been doing some work with universities to go and look at the impact of these technologies. Because fundamentally, if it doesn't have an impact, 
it's not worth doing. And what we found was that, yes, people are able to understand how to use these systems. They've been working with mobile phones for a long, long time. And overwhelmingly, people tell us that they are saving time and they're saving money by using pay-as-you-go solo. Specifically, in the group that we talked to, their average spend on kerosene went down from $2.30 per week down to $0.30. Cents. But this service model is something that right now is being used for light and for mobile phone charging but in the future can be applied to a whole range of different things. And it has two important benefits for people in rural communities. The first one is, if you're working in the agricultural sector, your income is by definition intermittent. And so it's important to have a payment model which also has the ability to be intermittent. The second one is that for individuals earning $3 a day, it is tremendously difficult to save up funds. If you go and buy a product that costs $30 or $40, that is an enormous risk. It's a huge amount of money that you've tied up. But the service model turns that around. Now the risk is on the service provider, because if the product doesn't work, the service provider doesn't get paid. And so the individual in the rural community no longer has the risk from purchasing those products. A little while ago, we were invited to Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is a fascinating country. Ten years ago, it was in the midst of a brutal civil war. Today, it's one of the fastest growing countries in Africa. We were invited by a women's group on International Women's Day. And they were telling us about some of the hardships that women in particular face from having a lack of electricity. In Sierra Leone, many of the rural clinics don't have access to electricity. And so when it's a woman's time to give birth, she goes to the clinic and she has to take a candle with her in order to be able to give birth by candlelight. And if she can't afford that candle, she has to give birth in the dark. There's a campaign that's being run by these women's groups to try and bring power to these uh, clinics in order to eliminate that problem. And we've been working with those women's groups in order to be able to bring power to rural houses inside Sierra Leone. And what's amazed us has been the ingenuity that people have shown in the way that they've managed to use that power. Fishermen have been rigging up solar lights in the masts of their boats so that they're able to fish all the way through the night. Shopkeepers have lights inside their stores so they can uh, sell products throughout the, uh, the evening time. And school children, on average, study for between one and two hours extra per night when they've got solar light compared to candles or water kerosene. And women tell us that when they're working at home, they have the ability to charge other people's mobile phones and so be able to get additional income as a result. As we go talking to people in these communities, people tell us that actually they want more. They don't just want to have light, they don't just want mobile phones, but actually they've got the same aspirations as you and I. And we've developed this notion of what's called an energy escalator. It's a way in which people can start with a very small power system and progressively upgrade to a bigger and bigger one. And what this does is to give people access to the knowledge economy. A small amount of power plus the internet equals knowledge. And you'd be amazed at what a level that is. A tweet is a tweet. It doesn't matter if it comes from a hut in Ethiopia or it comes from a penthouse in Manhattan. It provides access to a new way of working to a whole new generation. This aspiration, I think, is quite nicely uh, shown by this photo. These kids are playing, and as you see, they've got mobile phones. Actually, they don't have mobile phones, they're made out of mud. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not toys. 
what they're doing is expressing their view of what they want to be like in the future. They want their MP3 players. They want their mobile phone. And what we need to do is to find ways of being able to harness this creativity and bring this to the mass within Africa. To do that, we need to harness the financial services industry to be able to provide commercial loans to enable people to afford this technology. Because by having access to energy, people are able to step over the Industrial Revolution and become fully-fledged citizens of the knowledge economy. Thank you very much.